All right, so today the six conservative justices on the Supreme Court uh, ruled that a Colorado graphic designer who wants to create wedding websites has the right to deny her services to same-sex couples. Uh, that designer, a woman named Lori Smith, has not started her wedding website business yet, but says that her Christian faith prevents her from doing work that celebrates same-sex marriage. Uh, Smith wants to post a statement explaining that her policy is actually uh, based on her religious beliefs. So she sued. She sued to get an exemption from Colorado's anti-discrimination law that prohibits discrimination against LGBTQ plus people by businesses that serve the public. Now, as this case was uh, making its way through the judicial process all the way up to the Supreme Court, Lori Smith's lawyers argued in a brief to the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals that she had received a request from a prospective customer named Stuart inquiring about a website to celebrate his wedding to his fiancée, a person named Mike. Now, this week, as Supreme Court justices were set to decide whether Lori Smith should be able to turn someone like that alleged prospective customer named Stuart, uh, turn him away, a reporter at the New Republic decided to get his contact information from the publicly available filing and reach out to him to hear what he has to say, find out what was going on. And what he had to say was actually startling. Stewart claimed he never sent that inquiry, and at the time it was sent, he was married to a woman. Quote, I'm married. I have a child. I'm not really sure where that came from. But somebody is using false information in a Supreme Court filing document. He also questioned why he, a web designer living in San Francisco, would seek to hire someone in another state who has never built a wedding website, let alone a website for a same-sex wedding, to build his wedding website. So despite the very real questions raised by this reporting today, conservative justices went ahead and ruled in Lori Smith's favor and opened the door to discrimination against the LGBTQ plus community in this country. Here's what Justice Sonia Sotomayor said in her dissent, a dissent that she read aloud from the bench today to emphasize her disagreement. She wrote in part, quote, by issuing this new license to discriminate in a case brought by a company that seeks to deny same-sex couples the full and equal enjoyment of its services, the immediate Symbolic effect of the decision is to mark gays and lesbians for second-class status. In this way, the decision itself inflicts a kind of stigmatic harm on top of any harm caused by denials of service. Joining me now is Melissa Jira Grant, staff writer at The New Republic, author of that report. Ms. Grant, thank you so much for being here. So I, I have a lot of questions. I mean, th this reporting was incredible, but... Let me start by just the basics, which how sure are you that the Stuart you spoke to is in fact telling the truth? Stuart, first of all, was very surprised to hear from me. Um, you know, when I came across this phone number in the filing, I kind of thought, you know, we've seen this in other cases and in other instances of anti-queer and anti-trans discrimination. If someone's notorious for that, sometimes they get trolled or spammed. That's what I thought I was calling about. That's what I thought I was going to hear. Um, and instead, I talked to this very sweet, progressive guy who's shocked to even hear from me. I was shocked. I mean, I expected him to be like, oh, I've been called by like, you know, five reporters, 10 reporters over the years. My number has been floating around since 2016. Nothing. Um, and in fact, he was aware of the case, but only when it was argued at the Supreme Court, because the web design and design community were discussing it in the context of their own work and what it might mean. So... Given the fact that this is an inquiry made with his real name, real phone number, real email address, um, and real URL for his company at the time, which was all publicly available, I think the chances are more likely that somebody used his identity. If he was going to do this in a fraudulent way or in a harassing way, why would he do so under his own mm. identity? It just doesn't make sense. So uh, Kristen Wagoner, the president of the conservative Christian legal nonprofit alliance Defending Freedom, uh, and the lawyer who argued this before the Supreme Court, uh, responded to your reporting on a press call earlier, uh, and she called it untrue. I want to play for you and our viewers just a part of what she had to say. Listen. 
Lori received a website request, design request from a third party. Even Colorado agreed. It's not her responsibility, nor is she able to do background checks on those who she's receiving these requests from, because Colorado has told her that if she declines in any way a request like this, she puts herself in the crosshairs of this law. Um, so again, the, it's undisputed that the request was received. It was re received by a third party, whether that was a troll and not a genuine request, or it was someone who was looking for that. You alluded to that in your first answer, but can you just, what is your response to having heard that now? Honestly, it's the first I've heard from ADF. You know, I sent them questions before my story published. They didn't respond to them. I pressed them again today, and their response was to send me a link to a thread that they had made on Twitter. Um, I think Ms. Wagoner's responses there are fairly misleading. You know, if we want to talk about what Colorado decided, we had a federal court in Colorado say that this inquiry didn't feel like it provided evidence of any customers. You know, one of the things that Alliance Defending Freedom is, you know, part of an openly anti-queer and anti-trans project. One of the things they've been misleading the public into thinking is that this wasn't about whether or not there was a real inquiry. It was that her speech was like restrained before the fact. Um, and that someday if someone wanted her services, they would not be able to do that because of the law. But that's simply not true. And I don't believe that she would be violating the law simply by doing what I did and picking up the phone and, you know, checking it out. Hi, this is Stuart. Are you a part of a same-sex couple? You know, maybe she was scared she'd be putting herself in legal peril. I don't know what she was advised mm. by Lines Defending Freedom. Um, but it's shocking to me what Stuart told me, that not only has he not heard from reporters, he's never heard from anyone trying to check this out. Just the smallest, it's not a background check to pick up the phone, right? I, I think that there were a lot of questions about this case, feeling like it was built on essentially hypotheticals. You know, someday, somewhere, a same-sex couple might ask for this service. And so it totally lines up for me anyway to see this inquiry as part of that much bigger picture that Alliance Defending Freedom is essentially defending somebody from something that has not happened yet, yeah. that she thinks might happen. Uh, it is quite remarkable. I mean, when you put it in the context of everything else that the Supreme Court is under scrutiny for, that this particular detail in this case had been uh, overlooked. Uh, Melissa Jira Grant, thank you so much for your reporting. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I greatly appreciate it. Thanks again.